Section 11 of the Aeneid of Virgil. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid of Virgil. Translated by John Dryden. Book 6, Part 1. He said and wept then spread his sails before the winds, and reached at length the Cumaean shore. Their anchors dropped, his crew the vessels moor, they turn their heads to sea, their sterns to land, and greet with greedy joy the Italian strand. Some strike from clashing flints their fiery seed, some gather sticks the kindled flames to feed. Or search for hollow trees, and fell the woods, or trace through valleys the discovered floods. Thus, while their several charges they fulfill, the pious prince ascends the sacred hill, where Phoebus is adored and seeks the shade which hides from sight his venerable maid. Deep in a cave the Sibyl makes abode, thence full of fate returns and of the god. Through Trivia's grove they walk, and now behold, and enter now the temple roofed with gold. When Daedalus, to fly the Cretan shore, his heavy limbs on jointed pinions bore, the first who sailed in air, tis sung by fame, to the Cumaean coast at length he came, and here alighting built this costly frame. Inscribed to Phoebus, here he hung on high the steerage of his wings that cut the sky. Then o'er the lofty gate his art embossed, Androgeus's death, and offerings to his ghost. Seven youths from Athens yearly sent to meet the fate appointed by revengeful Crete, and next to those the dreadful urn was placed, in which the destined names by lots were cast. The mournful parents stand around in tears, and rising Crete against their shore appears. There, too, in living sculpture might be seen the mad affection of the Cretan queen. Then how she cheats her bellowing lover's eye, the rushing leap, the doubtful progeny, the lower part a beast, a man above, the monument of their polluted love. Not far from thence he graved the wondrous maze, a thousand doors, a thousand winding ways, here dwells the monster hid from human view, not to be found but by the faithful clue, till the kind artist moved with pious grief, lent to the loving maid this last relief, and all those erring paths described so well that Theseus conquered and the monster fell. Here hapless Icarus had found his part, had not the father's grief restrained his art, he twice essayed to cast his son in gold, twice from his hands he dropped the forming mould. All this with wondering eyes Aeneas viewed, each varying object his delight renewed, eager to read the rest. Achates came, and by his side the mad divining dame, the priestess of the god Deifove her name. Time suffers not, she said, to feed your eyes with empty pleasures, Haste the sacrifice. Seven bullocks yet unyoked for Phoebus choose, And for Diana seven unspotted ewes. This said, the servants urge the sacred rites, While to the temple she the prince invites. A spacious cave within its farmost part Was hewed and fashioned by laborious art, Through the hill's hollow sides before the place a hundred doors, a hundred entries grace. As many voices issue, and the sound of Sibyl's words as many times rebound. Now to the mouth they come. Aloud she cries, This is the time. Inquire your destinies. He comes. Behold the God. Thus while she said, and shivering at the sacred entry stayed, her color changed, her face was not the same and hollow groans from her deep spirit came. Her hair stood up, convulsive rage possessed her trembling limbs and heaved her laboring breast. Greater than humankind she seemed to look, and with an accent more than mortal spoke. 
her staring eyes with sparkling fury roll when all the god came rushing on her soul swiftly she turned and foaming as she spoke why this delay she cried the powers invoke thy prayers alone can open this abode else vain are my demands and dumb the god she said no more the trembling trojans here o'erspread with a damp sweat and holy fear the prince himself with awful dread possessed his vows to great apollo thus addressed indulgent god propitious power to troy swift to relieve unwilling to destroy directed by whose hand the dart and dart pierced the proud grecian's only mortal part thus far by fate's decrees and thy commands through ambient seas and through devouring sands our exiled crew has sought the ausonian ground and now at length the flying coast is found thus far the fate of troy from place to place with fury has pursued her wandering race here cease ye powers and let your vengeance end troy is no more and can no more offend and thou o sacred maid inspired to see the event of things in dark futurity give me what heaven has promised to my fate to conquer and command the latian state to fix my wandering gods and find a place for the long exiles of the trojan race then shall my grateful hands a temple rear to the twin gods with vows and solemn prayer and annual rites and festivals and games shall be performed to their auspicious names nor shalt thou want thy honours in my land for there thy faithful oracles shall stand preserved in shrines and every sacred lay which by thy mouth apollo shall convey all shall be treasured by a chosen train of holy priests and ever shall remain but o oh, commit not thy prophetic mind to flitting leaves the sport of every wind lest they disperse in air our empty fate write not but what the powers ordain relate struggling in vain impatient of her load and labouring underneath the ponderous god the more she strove to shake him from her breast with more and far superior force he pressed commands his entrance and without control usurps her organs and inspires her soul now with a furious blast the hundred doors ope of themselves a rushing whirlwind roars within the cave and sibyl's voice restores escaped the dangers of the watery rain yet more and greater ills by land remain the coast so long desired nor doubt the event thy troops shall reach but having reached repent wars horrid wars i view a field of blood and tiber rolling with a purple flood simois nor xanthus shall be wanting there a new achilles shall in arms appear and he too goddess born fierce juno's hate added to hostile force shall urge thy fate to what strange nations shalt not thou resort driven to solicit aid at every court the cause the same which ilium once oppressed a foreign mistress and a foreign guest but thou secure of soul unbent with woes the more thy fortune frowns the more oppose the dawnings of thy safety shall be shown from whence thou least shalt hope a grecian town thus from the dark recess the sibyl spoke and the resisting air the thunder broke the cave rebellowed and the temple shook the ambiguous god who ruled her laboring breast in these mysterious words his mind expressed some truths revealed in terms involved the rest at length her fury fell her foaming ceased and ebbing in her soul the god decreased then thus the chief no terror to my view no frightful face of danger can be new inured to suffer and resolved to dare the fates without my power shall be without my care this let me crave since near your grove the road to hell lies open and the dark abode which acheron surrounds the innavigable flood conduct me through the regions void of light 
and lead me longing to my father's sight for him a thousand dangers i have sought and rushing where the thickest grecians fought safe on my back the sacred burthen brought he for my sake the raging ocean tried and wrath of heaven my still auspicious guide and bore beyond the strength decrepit age supplied oft since he breathed his last in dead of night his reverend image stood before my sight enjoined to seek below his holy shade conducted there by your unerring aid but you if pious minds by prayers are won oblige the father and protect the son yours is the power nor proserpine in vain has made you priestess of her nightly reign if orpheus armed with his enchanting lyre the ruthless king with pity could inspire and from the shades below redeem his wife if pollux offering his alternate life could free his brother and can daily go by turns aloft by turns descend below why name i theseus or his greater friend who trod the downward path and upward could ascend not less than theirs from jove my lineage came my mother greater my descent the same so prayed the trojan prince and while he prayed his hand upon the holy altar laid then thus replied the prophetess divine o goddess born of great anchises line the gates of hell are open night and day smooth the descent and easy is the way but to return and view the cheerful skies in this the task and mighty labor lies to few great jupiter imparts this grace and those of shining worth and heavenly race betwixt those regions and our upper light deep forests and impenetrable night possess the middle space the infernal bounds cocytus with his sable waves surrounds but if so dire a love your soul invades as twice below to view the trembling shades if you so hard a toil will undertake as twice to pass the innavigable lake receive my counsel in the neighboring grove there stands a tree the queen of stygian jove claims it her own thick woods and gloomy night conceal the happy plant from human sight one bough it bears but wondrous to behold the ductile rind and leaves of radiant gold this from the vulgar branches must be torn and to fair proserpine the present born ere leave be given to tempt the nether skies the first thus rent a second will arise and the same metal the same room supplies look round the wood with lifted eyes to see the lurking gold upon the fatal tree then rend it off as holy rites command the willing metal will obey thy hand following with ease if favoured by thy fate thou art foredoomed to view the stygian state if not no labour can the tree constrain and strength of stubborn arms and steel are vain besides you know not while you here attend the unworthy fate of your unhappy friend breathless he lies and his unburied ghost deprived of funeral rites pollutes your host pay first his pious dues and for the dead two sable sheep around his hearse be led then living turfs upon his body lay this done securely take the destined way to find the regions destitute of day she said and held her peace aeneas went sad from the cave and full of discontent unknowing whom the sacred sibyl meant achates the companion of his breast goes grieving by his side with equal cares oppressed walking they talked and fruitlessly divined what friend the priestess by those words designed but soon they found an object to deplore misenus lay extended on the shore son of the god of winds none so renowned the warrior trumpet in the field to sound with breathing brass to kindle fierce alarms and rouse to dare their fate in honourable arms he served great hector and was ever near 
not with his trumpet only but his spear but by pelides arms when hector fell he chose aeneas and he chose as well swollen with applause and aiming still at more he now provokes the sea-gods from the shore with envy triton heard the martial sound and the bold champion for his challenge drowned then cast his mangled carcass on the strand the gazing crowd around the body stand all weep but most aeneas mourns his fate and hastens to perform the funeral state in altar wise a stately pile they rear the basis broad below and top advanced in air an ancient wood fit for the work designed the shady covert of the savage kind the trojans found the sounding axe is plied firs pines and pitch trees and the towering pride of forest ashes feel the fatal stroke and piercing wedges cleave the stubborn oak huge trunks of trees felled from the steepy crown of the bare mountains roll with ruin down armed like the rest the trojan prince appears and by his pious labor urges theirs thus while he wrought revolving in his mind the ways to compass what his wish designed he cast his eyes upon the gloomy grove and then with vows implored the queen of love o oh, may thy power propitious still to me conduct my steps to find the fatal tree in this deep forest since the sibyl's breath foretold alas too true Mecenas' death scarce had he said when full before his sight two doves descending from their airy flight secure upon the grassy plain alight he knew his mother's birds and thus he prayed be you my guides with your auspicious aid and lead my footsteps till the branch be found whose glittering shadow gilds the sacred ground and thou great parent with celestial care in this distress be present to my prayer thus having said he stopped with watchful sight observing still the motions of their flight what course they took what happy signs they shew they fed and fluttering by degrees withdrew still farther from the place but still in view hopping and flying thus they led him on to the slow lake whose baleful stench to shun they winged their flight aloft then stooping low perched on the double tree that bears the golden bough through the green leaves the glittering shadows glow as on the sacred oak the wintry mistletoe where the proud mother views her precious brood and happier branches which she never sowed such was the glittering such the ruddy rind and dancing leaves that wantoned in the wind he seized the shining bough with griping hold and rent away with ease the lingering gold then to the sibyl's palace bore the prize meantime the trojan troops with weeping eyes to dead Mecenas pay his obsequies first from the ground a lofty pile they rear of pitch trees oaks and pines and unctuous fir the fabric's front with cypress twigs they strew and stick the sides with boughs of baleful yew the topmost part his glittering arms adorn warm waters then in brazen cauldrons borne are poured to wash his body joint by joint and fragrant oils the stiffened limbs anoint with groans and cries Mecenas they deplore then on a bier with purple covered o'er the breathless body thus bewailed they lay and fire the pile their faces turned away such reverend rites their fathers used to pay pure oil and incense on the fire they throw and fat of victims which his friends bestow these gifts the greedy flames to dust devour then on the living coals red wine they pour and last the relics by themselves dispose which in a brazen urn the priests enclose old corineus compassed thrice the crew and dipped an olive branch in holy dew which thrice he sprinkled round and thrice aloud invoked the dead and then dismissed the crowd 
but good aeneas ordered on the shore a stately tomb whose top a trumpet bore a soldier's falchion at a seaman's oar thus was his friend interred and deathless fame still to the lofty cape consigns his name these rites performed the prince without delay hastes to the nether world his destined way deep was the cave and downward as it went from the wide mouth a rocky rough descent and here the access a gloomy grove defends and there the innavigable lake extends o'er whose unhappy waters void of light no bird presumes to steer his airy flight such deadly stenches from the depths arise and steaming sulphur that infects the skies from hence the grecian bards their legends make and give the name avernus to the lake four sable bullocks in the yoke untaught for sacrifice the pious hero brought the priestess pours the wine betwixt their horns then cuts the curling hair that first oblation burns invoking hecate hither to repair a powerful name in hell and upper air the sacred priests with ready knives bereave the beasts of life and in full bowls receive the streaming blood a lamb to hell and night the sable wool without a streak of white aeneas offers and by fate's decree a barren heifer Pine to thee with holocausts he pluto's altar fills seven brawny bulls with his own hand he kills then on the broiling entrails oil he pours which anointed thus the raging flame devours late the nocturnal sacrifice begun nor ended till the next returning sun then earth began to bellow trees to dance and howling dogs in glimmering light advance ere hecate came far hence be souls profane the sibyl cried and from the grove abstain now trojan take the way thy fates afford assume thy courage and unsheathe thy sword she said and passed along the gloomy space the prince pursued her steps with equal pace ye realms yet unrevealed to human sight ye gods who rule the regions of the night ye gliding ghosts permit me to relate the mystic wonders of your silent state obscure they went through dreary shades that led along the waste dominions of the dead thus wander travellers in woods by night by the moon's doubtful and malignant light when jove in dusky clouds involves the skies and the faint crescent shoots by fits before their eyes just in the gate and in the jaws of hell revengeful cares and sullen sorrows dwell and pale diseases and repining age want fear and famine's unresisted rage here toils and death and death's half-brother sleep forms terrible to view their sentry keep with anxious pleasures of a guilty mind deep frauds before and open force behind the fury's iron beds and strife that shakes her hissing tresses and unfolds her snakes full in the midst of this infernal road an elm displays her dusky arms abroad the god of sleep there hides his heavy head and empty dreams on every leaf are spread of various forms unnumbered spectres more centaurs and double shapes besiege the door before the passage horrid hydra stands and briareus with his hundred hands gorgons geryon with his triple frame and vain chimera vomits empty flame the chief unsheathed his shining steel prepared though seized with sudden fear to force the guard offering his brandished weapon at their face had not the sibyl stopped his eager pace and told him what those empty phantoms were forms without bodies and impassive air hence to deep acheron they take their way whose troubled eddies thick with ooze and clay are whirled aloft 
and in Cocytus lost. There Charon stands, who rules the dreary coast, a sordid god. Down from his hoary chin a length of beard descends, uncombed, unclean. His eyes like hollow furnaces on fire. A girdle, foul with grease, binds his obscene attire. He spreads his canvas, with his pole he steers, the freights of flitting ghosts in his thin bottom bears. He looked in years, yet in his years were seen a youthful vigor and autumnal green. An airy crowd came rushing where he stood, which filled the margin of the fatal flood. Husbands and wives, boys and unmarried maids, and mighty heroes more majestic shades, and youths entombed before their father's eyes with hollow groans and shrieks and feeble cries, thick as the leaves in autumn strow the woods, or fowls by winter forced forsake the floods, and wing their hasty flight to happier lands. Such and so thick the shivering army stands, and press for passage with extended hands. Now these, now those, the surly boatman bore, the rest he drove to distance from the shore. The hero who beheld with wandering eyes the tumult mixed with shrieks, laments, and cries, asked of his guide what the rude concourse meant, why to the shore the thronging people bent, what forms of law among the ghosts were used, why some were ferried o'er and some refused. Son of Anchises, offspring of the gods, the sibyl said, you see the Stygian floods. The sacred stream which heaven's imperial state attests in oaths and fears to violate. The ghosts rejected are the unhappy crew deprived of sepulchres and funeral due. The boatman Charon, those the buried host, he ferries over to the farther coast. Nor dares his transport vessel cross the waves with such whose bones are not composed in graves. A hundred years they wander on the shore, at length their penance done are wafted o'er. The Trojan chief his forward pace repressed, revolving anxious thoughts within his breast. He saw his friends, who, whelmed beneath the waves, their funeral honours claimed and asked their quiet graves. The lost Lucaspis in the crowd he knew, and the brave leader of the Lycian crew, whom on the Tyrrhene seas the tempests met, the sailors mastered and the ship o'erset. Amidst the spirits Polynurus pressed, yet fresh from life a new admitted guest, who while he steering viewed the stars and bore his course from Afric to the Latian shore, fell headlong down. The Trojan fixed his view, and scarcely through the gloom the sullen shadow knew. Then thus the prince, What envious power, O friend, brought your loved life to this disastrous end? For Phoebus, ever true in all he said, has in your fate alone my faith betrayed. The god foretold you should not die before you reached, secure from seas, the Italian shore. Is this the unerring power? The ghost replied, Nor Phoebus flattered, nor his answers lied, nor envious gods have sent me to the deep. But while the stars and course of heaven I keep, my wearied eyes were seized with fatal sleep. I fell, and with my weight the helm constrained was drawn along, which yet my grip retained. Now by the winds and raging waves I swear your safety more than mine was then my care. Lest of the guide bereft the rudder lost, your ship should run against the rocky coast. Three blustering nights, Born by the southern blast, I floated and discovered land at last. High on a mounting wave my head I bore, forcing my strength and gathering to the shore. Panting, but past the danger, now I seized the craggy cliffs, and my tired members eased. While cumbered with my dropping clothes I lay, the cruel nation covetous of prey, stained with my blood the unhospitable coast. 
and now by winds and waves my lifeless limbs are tossed which o oh, avert by yon ethereal light which i have lost for this eternal night or if by dearer ties you may be won by your dead sire and by your living son redeem from this reproach my wandering ghost or with your navy seek the velin coast and in a peaceful grave my corpse compose or if a nearer way your mother shows without whose aid you durst not undertake this frightful passage o'er the stygian lake lend to this wretch your hand and waft him o'er to the sweet banks of yon forbidden shore scarce had he said the prophetess began what hopes delude thee miserable man think'st thou thus unintombed to cross the floods to view the furies and infernal gods and visit without leave the dark abodes attend the term of long revolving years fate and the dooming gods are deaf to tears this comfort of thy dire misfortune take the wrath of heaven inflicted for thy sake with vengeance shall pursue the inhuman coast till they propitiate thy offended ghost and raise a tomb with vows and solemn prayer and palinurus name the place shall bear this calmed his cares soothed with his future fame and pleased to hear his propagated name now nearer to the stygian lake they draw whom from the shore the surly boatman saw observed their passage through the shady wood and marked their near approaches to the flood then thus he called aloud inflamed with wrath mortal whate'er who this forbidden path in arms presumes to tread i charge thee stand and tell thy name and business in the land know this the realm of night the stygian shore my boat conveys no living bodies o'er nor was i pleased great theseus once to bear who forced a passage with his pointed spear nor strong alcides men of mighty fame and from the immortal gods their lineage came in fetters won the barking porter tied and took him trembling from his sovereign side too sought by force to seize his beauteous bride to whom the sibyl thus compose thy mind nor frauds are here contrived nor force designed still may the dog the wandering troops constrain of airy ghosts and vex the guilty train and with her grisly lord his lovely queen remain the trojan chief whose lineage is from jove much famed for arms and more for filial love is sent to seek his sire in your elysian grove if neither piety nor heaven's command can gain his passage to the stygian strand this fatal present shall prevail at least then showed the shining bow concealed within her vest no more was needful for the gloomy god stood mute with awe to see the golden rod admired the destined offering to his queen a venerable gift so rarely seen his fury thus appeased he puts to land the ghosts forsake their seats at his command he clears the deck receives the mighty freight the leaky vessel groans beneath the weight slowly she sails and scarcely stems the tides the pressing water pours within her sides his passengers at length are wafted o'er exposed in muddy weeds upon the miry shore no sooner landed in his den they found the triple porter of the stygian sound grim cerberus who soon began to rear his crested snakes and armed his bristling hair the prudent sibyl had before prepared a sop in honey steeped to charm the guard which mixed with powerful drugs she cast before his greedy grinning jaws just oped to roar with three enormous mouths he gapes and straight with hunger pressed devours the pleasing bait long draughts of sleep his monstrous limbs enslave he reels and falling 
fills the spacious cave the keeper charmed the chief without delay passed on and took the irremeable way before the gates the cries of babes new-born whom fate had from their tender mothers torn assault his ears then those whom form of laws condemned to die when traitors judged their cause nor want they lots nor judges to review the wrongful sentence and award anew minos the strict inquisitor appears and lives and crimes with his assessors hears round in his urn the blended balls he rolls absolves the just and dooms the guilty souls the next in place and punishment are they who prodigally throw their souls away fools who repining at their wretched state and loathing anxious life suborned their fate with late repentance now they would retrieve the bodies they forsook and wish to live their pains and poverty desire to bear to view the light of heaven and breathe the vital air but fate forbids the stygian floods oppose and with circling streams the captive souls enclose end of section 11